This video takes a brief and simple look at batteries, those everyday objects without which modern day life would be so vastly different. Answering questions such as, what is a battery made of? What types of battery are there? And who invented the battery? Many of the materials that we find in a battery are mined and distilled in huge engineering operations that remove many thousands of tons of rock and soil for just a few kilograms of the vital minerals that make up a battery. These mining operations are carried out in Chile, Australia and China amongst others. Many of the ores are shipped across the world to specialist processing plants that refine the raw materials into the very pure minerals that are needed at an ever-increasing rate. The contents of the battery in your mobile phone may have travelled around the world more than once and visited several countries for refining and processing before they are assembled into the battery that you have inside your phone today. Some of the minerals, the elements that are mined for battery manufacturing, will include the following eight products that are used in varying ratios. Aluminium, cobalt, copper, graphite, iron, lithium, manganese and nickel. And there are others. The earliest known example of something that resembles a battery was discovered near Baghdad in modern day Iraq. This has become known as the Baghdad battery and is thought to be over 2000 years old. It is unlikely to have been used in the same way as the batteries of today because, at the time, there just wasn't the need for batteries as we use them today. More likely, it is thought, the Baghdad battery was used to electroplate precious metals onto base metals for jewellery and other objects. It comprised a clay pot filled with, we think, a solution of wine or vinegar to act as an electrolyte. A copper tube and an iron bar were found in the pot and these would have been the positive and negative terminals of this very early and very basic electrical cell. It was not until the mid to late 1700s that battery technology became the subject of serious scientific research. One of the early pioneers was Alessandro Volta and he is credited with developing one of the first batteries. He experimented with alternating layers of metals for the electrodes, with an electrolyte and separator between each, which was soaked in a variety of liquids, ranging from wines and vinegars to brine solutions. Some believe he also experimented with urine as an electrolyte solution. He successfully developed a working battery comprising alternating layers of copper and zinc, with the paper separated between each metal being soaked in a saline solution. This pile of alternating plates and paper became known as a pile, and even today the word pile is an alternative way of saying battery. In his honour, in the early 1800s, the unit of potential difference, the volt, was named after him. The Le Clanche cell was invented and patented by a French scientist. Georges Le Clanchet in the mid 1800s. Although this is a wet cell, the same technology was later used to develop the dry cell. Each cell produced about 1.4 volts, but its in use life, its service life, was quite limited. Despite this, it did find a lot of use in telegraphy and signalling, and the dry cell variant was used in early telephone technology. Whilst long conversations exhausted the battery quite quickly, it was found that if the call was kept very short, with a long rest period between calls, then the battery would recover some of its charge and keep its charge much longer. This ability to reverse the chemical reactions and recover the charge is similar to what happens today when recharging a battery. Shown here is the battery symbol used on electrical drawings and circuit diagrams. It consists of a long line and a short line. One side is the positive terminal, the other 
is the negative terminal. We are often asked if there is an easy way to remember the positive and negative sides of the battery symbol, and of course there is. This is how I remember it. Take the standard symbol and separate the long and short lines as shown. The short line will remain unaltered. The long line is usually drawn about twice the length of the short one. So split the long line into two equal parts. Divide it into two. Then rotate one of the halves by 90 degrees and the two halves can now be recombined into a plus symbol to indicate the positive terminal. And there we have it. The long line can make a plus sign, so the long line is the positive terminal, and the short line is the negative terminal. This is the circuit diagram for a simple single transistor battery radio. We can see the battery symbol in use on the right of the diagram. It's showing two batteries in series to give a supply voltage of 3 volts. In an electrical circuit, we now know that if the circuit is complete, electrons will flow from the negative terminal of the supply, or battery in this case, and travel along the wires through the load, and a lamp is shown here, and then return to the battery at the positive terminal. As the electrons flow through the lamp, they cause the filament to heat up and glow white hot, and light is produced. These terminals have their own unique names. The cathode is the positive terminal and the anode is the negative. But how to remember them? Try this method. The anode has the letter N in it and N is for negative. So the anode with the N is the negative terminal. An easy way to remember it. We can arrange batteries into groups, either in a long line end to end or as a group placed side by side. The effect on the voltage and available current is very different. Arranged in series, end to end, the voltage will increase, but the available current will remain the same. Shown here, three 1.5 volt batteries with a 1 amp hour charge will become one 4.5 volt battery with the same 1 amp hour charge. Now place the batteries side by side, what we call in parallel, and the voltage will stay the same at 1.5 volts. But the available current is now 3 amp hours. It should last 3 times longer. When arranging batteries in series or parallel, we should always ensure that all the batteries are the same type, that they are equally charged and in good condition. A weak battery can impair the performance of the other batteries. A battery then will consist of a cathode, an anode and an electrolyte. The materials that make up the two terminals must be physically kept apart. Shown here, they are separated from each other by their position in the electrolyte bath. But in some batteries, a separator must be included to stop the two terminals touching each other. As we said before, electrons will flow in a completed outside circuit from negative to positive. Internally, ions will flow from the negative to the positive to keep the cell chemically balanced. Electrons will flow outside the battery, ions will flow inside the battery. When recharging a battery, electrons and ions will flow in the opposite direction, from positive to negative. Batteries are made from many dissimilar materials and use different electrolytes depending on what they are used for. This table shows some of the primary cell types that are available and some of their uses. Primary cells are one-time use only. When they are discharged, commonly called flat, they must be disposed of, preferably recycled. They cannot be recharged the chemical reactions that took place inside the battery cannot be reversed. Secondary cells or rechargeable batteries can have the internal chemical reactions reversed by applying a suitable charging voltage and current to them. Typical rechargeable batteries that we might come across may include the lead acid types. 
the nickel cadmium and nickel metal hydride varieties, and the increasingly common lithium ion batteries. There has been a trend to remove mercury and cadmium from batteries over recent years, given the environmental and health concerns reported in the press. The rechargeable types can be split into two groups with quite different uses. They can be used as a UPS or uninterruptible power supply, which is permanently connected to a main source which keeps the battery at optimum charge. Then, in the event of a mains failure, the UPS is enabled and can provide power for several hours until the mains supply is restored. This can be anything from emergency lighting to whole sections of a commercial building, especially medical and data centres. Or they may be used as portable batteries as we see in many everyday tools and devices such as laptops, mobile phones, hand tools, torches and all the way up to electric vehicles. Used in the same way as primary batteries with the advantage that they can be recharged when the energy in the battery is depleted. You will recognise some of the applications for single-use batteries and we still use these on a very frequent basis. They are relatively cheap, readily available and convenient. Rechargeable batteries are all around us too. Power tools at work or for DIY projects, rechargeable torches and lanterns and just about everyone has a mobile phone with a rechargeable battery. And not forgetting electric vehicles. From cars to utility vehicles, electric battery technology is being developed in leaps and bounds to make electric vehicles more reliable and with increasing mileage ranges to rival those of petrol vehicles. Just to remind ourselves, when the battery is in use, when the external electrical circuit is completed, in other words, the switch is turned on, the battery will supply an electrical current in the form of electrons flowing from the negative terminal, the anode, to the positive terminal, the cathode. At the same time, there will be a flow of ions inside the battery, through the electrolyte, from the anode, again, to the cathode. When the supply of electrons and ions available at the anode has been depleted, the battery is considered flat. To recharge a secondary battery, it's necessary to supply an external source of voltage and current to the battery, and the correct charger for the battery must be used. The charging circuit will cause the electrons and ions to move in the opposite direction, that is to say, from the cathode to the anode. Electrons will move through the external circuit and ions will flow through the electrolyte. When the chemical processes have been adequately reversed, when the anode and cathode have been restored to almost their original state, the battery is said to be fully charged. Primary batteries, as we have just said, are widely available, generally cheap, but they are single use only. They cannot be recharged and are considered a use and lose item. Many of the component parts of primary cells can in fact be recycled and the minerals and metals reprocessed in specialist plants. Secondary batteries have very much extended lifespans, with the ability to be discharged and recharged many times before the battery efficiency falls off. Many of us will have experienced this when the first frosts of winter arrive and our five-year-old battery suddenly refuses to start the car's engine. It's time to buy a new battery and allow the old one to be stripped down and reprocessed. Batteries can be made in many shapes and sizes and one popular format is in the shape of cylindrical batteries or cells. These are made from long, thin and flat strips of materials, an anode, a separator with an electrolyte jelly and finally a cathode. These component parts are then all rolled together into a cylinder, much like a Swiss roll. Within the industry, they are in fact called Swiss rolls or jelly rolls for obvious reasons. A roll of metal strips filled with an electrolyte jelly. 
Many of today's electric cars will use dozens, if not hundreds, of cylindrical cells rather than just one big battery mass, Tesla being an example. Many single cylindrical cells with the same characteristics and charge will be manufactured. A few of these individual cells will then be joined together to make a battery, nine cells as shown here for one battery. Many tens of these batteries will then be combined into a much larger battery array, sealed with an epoxy resin onto a tray, ready to be installed into the electric vehicle. Combined together like this, and using a state-of-the-art battery management system, they can supply the required voltages and current to maximise battery efficiency, so that the driving motor can apply the right torque to the road wheels at the right time and to maximise battery life in the most efficient way. Battery technology has developed over several hundred years and will continue to develop into the future. Battery manufacture is very mining intensive and the recycling of old batteries is becoming increasingly important as resources are used at ever increasing rates. As well as the minerals used within the actual battery, many other materials are consumed in the process of extraction and manufacture, including fossil fuels, diesel, petrol, coals, carbon, oils and plastics. Primary cells are single use. Once discharged, they cannot be recharged. Secondary cells are rechargeable. The chemical reactions of the in-use cycle can be reversed by the application of a suitable reversed electrical current. Secondary batteries will have a service life often many years, after which they become much less efficient and must be replaced. Thank you for watching, it really is appreciated, and I hope that you found this video useful and informative. Please subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our videos, and remember to click on notify to be sure of not missing our next video. And you will find even more information, videos and help on our website at learnelectrics.com And don't forget, you can also type in Learn Electrics, all one word, into the YouTube search bar to go directly to our channel at any time from any computer. We are constantly adding new videos to our channel, so don't miss the next one. And once again, thank you for watching, and we hope to see you again very soon.